what I'll, I'll talk about here is, is it's not a, a system that is already in place in Svalbard. It is more a, a concept uh, that we are working on uh, with uh, funding from the European Space Agency and uh, some funding from the Norwegian Space Agency. Uh, so we're working to try to realize an airborne radar uh, system in Svalbard on, on the Dornier. Uh, so I'll tell you more about that uh, now. Uh, it's a dual frequency system that we are aiming to, to install. Uh, the Dornier is here. This is LM Lyr. Uh, you all know this very well. I will not spend a lot of time uh, on it. Uh, it's, a, it's a platform, it's an airborne platform, which is very well suited for uh, uh, remote sensing applications. Uh, we already have this radar pod, uh, this optical pod, sorry, uh, which is uh, in the front of the aircraft with the optical instrumentation. Uh, that uh, has been used in uh, many uh, SIOS campaigns. Uh, and I believe that uh, this has been uh, quite a good success. Uh, many scientists all over Svalbard uh, using data. This is an example of some of the sites that has been or has been planned to, to where, where data is, is supposed to be collected. Uh, this is optical data. It's a hyperspectral camera we have. Uh, there's also a medium format camera. But, uh, I mean, we all know that in Svalbard, uh, at high latitudes, it's, uh, it's a long period of the year with no or very limited uh, solar illumination. Uh, so you can see in this diagram that uh, from, say, October until March, the, the visibility or, or the uh, daylight is, is very limited. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, everyone who has lived in Svalbard or visited Svalbard knows that, especially in summer, there is often a, a, a cloud cover, which limits the usability of optical instrumentation. And this also goes for, uh, especially for the areas in uh, further north uh, over the ice edge, uh, there is very often a cloud cover. So there's an obvious need uh, to use radar systems. Uh, and of course, satellite radar is already very much used uh, exactly for these reasons that I'm mentioning now. So the system we're talking about here is uh, so-called synthetic aperture radar. Uh, it's a microwave uh, radar uh, transmitting uh, pulses. Uh, so it, it has its own energy. It is able to penetrate clouds uh, to a certain degree of vegetation, depending on the wavelength of the radar. Uh, it is a coherent radar, meaning that we are collecting uh, not only amplitude, uh, which is related to the, the, the backscattered energy from the target you are seeing, but we're also measuring phase. Uh, so we have uh, knowledge about the distance uh, from the uh, system uh, to the target on the ground uh, with a very high precision, uh, usually a, a fraction of the wavelength. Uh, the cartoon to the right shows uh, the typical uh, imaging geometry we have with a SAR uh, radar. You have a platform uh, which is flying along a trajectory. And while it's flying, it's uh, imaging uh, a swath on the ground. And this swath uh, for satellite systems could easily be uh, anything from a few kilometers to several hundred kilometers wide. Uh, depending on the spatial resolution. So there's always a trade-off between resolution and, um, and coverage. Uh, and the sensor is then collecting uh, an image uh, along the, uh, the path that the satellite is flying. So why would we use, what could we use a radar for in Svalbard? Uh, we, I'm trying to summarize uh, some of the uh, research topics that uh, we believe uh, such a system could uh, could be useful for uh, glaciers is quite obvious. It's 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 there's been numerous studies using uh, synthetic aperture radar data from satellite and airborne data uh, to look at uh, different glacier uh, properties uh, and and to see and to measure, uh, for example, the glacier velocities, uh, the flows. Uh, you can see one example in the upper left here. Uh, we could measure the, the mass balance uh, of glaciers. Uh, we could measure the calving uh, activity uh, and the crevices and, and so on. Um, 
The other thing is permafrost, the other example here. Uh, this is an image from uh, Cap Linnea, which shows uh, thawing uh, uh, of the active layer. So that's the ground motion, how the ground is responding to the thawing of, of the active layer. And this is this is quite important to know and to 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 be able to to regularly monitor, especially in times where with changing climate. And this is also very much related to uh, the point here of slope stability monitoring. Uh, so how it, how are the slopes behaving? Uh, how is their stability when it gets warmer and wetter? And uh, the one example in the lower left shows uh, how a uh, interferometric radar uh, could monitor or look at uh, ground movement so this is displacement over a few weeks uh, of an unstable rock slope in uh, in norway um, sea ice is very important uh, we all know that the workhorse for operational sea ice uh, mapping is satellite data but there is still uh, many unknown unknown uh, unknown parameters especially when it comes to uh, classification and segmentation of the different ice types. So the idea is then to use an airborne system which has much higher resolution. Uh, it could be dual frequency uh, to really improve uh, and to validate the satellite data that is, uh, that is collected. Uh, the last point here is uh, situational awareness. Uh, there is more and more ship traffic, both from cruise ships and the fishery industry, uh, moving uh, further north uh, with changing climate. Uh, it is very important to have systems that could assist uh, in improving what we call situational awareness. Uh, it could be detecting oil spills, uh, ship detection, uh, sea ice uh, mapping, classification, uh, and so on. Uh, so all of these research topics ha has led to this list that I'll go through now with some of the um, system parameters that we would like to uh, realize. Uh, we're looking into a dual frequency system, an L-band, 24 centimeter wavelength. Uh, it is very capable for interferometry purposes. Uh, it has uh, uh, capability to penetrate through snow. Um, and the X-band, on the other hand, is a uh, shorter wavelength than 3 centimeter, which provides finer spatial resolution and also the capability to, to detect uh, finer uh, scale uh, targets. Uh, uh, the polarimetric capability of either single, dual or quad pole or full, fully polarimetric uh, is important to be able to characterize uh, the surface. Uh, so different sea ice uh, types, for example. Uh, multiple antennas on the aircraft would allow for single pass interferometry, which could be used for topography or velocity. I'll explain that a bit in the next slide. Uh, we would like to have a left and right looking capability in order to have a wide area coverage and this is especially important for maritime surveillance uh, applications. Um, we have already a high precision inertial navigation system, which is absolutely necessary in order to support uh, repeat pass interferometry for ground motion studies or tomographic observations, which is uh, illustrated in the one figure here, where we are flying in a, in, a, in, a, in a parallel flight lines uh, at different altitudes. And by processing this uh, SAR data, the radar data, uh, it is possible to say something about the layering of, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, a glacier. But then you need to know the very precise uh, where the aircraft is. Uh, it is a radar, so it's all weather uh, capable. And it's it's also mounted on a on a on a on a aircraft which has a long endurance, which is important for these uh, two applications: search and rescue, and maritime surveillance. Um, so, this is uh, how uh, it could be realized. We already have the pod with optical instrumentation in the front. Uh, we are looking to place uh, some radar antennas on the rear part of the aircraft. Uh, the constraint that we are working with all the time is that we have to uh, 
we, we should be able to acquire data, scientific observation during regular flight operations. And this is a very unique, something which is very unique about this aircraft. It is in Svalbard and you, to collect science data or environmental monitoring data, you don't need to bring up a separate aircraft from the mainland of Norway or from, from the rest of Europe. The aircraft is already in Svalbard. So I think this is a, a pretty, pretty unique um, uh, opportunity we have now. Uh, it is a very important design criteria that we should be able to acquire uh, X and L band data at the same time. Uh, but also in parallel with uh, the optical instruments in the pod. Uh, and this allows to do coordinated campaigns uh, and also to coordinate that activity with, uh, for example, satellite, uh, uh, satellite observations. Um, here you can see some preliminary uh, numbers. Uh, so we are aiming to have a ground resolution of, of, of less than one meter and the swath width of about uh, two kilometers. Uh, these numbers are obviously dependent on the different types of uh, operating modes that we could, uh, that we could uh, design. So some of the scientific applications here, uh, if you have two antennas on the aircraft, we do have a sensitivity to topography, meaning that you could measure the surface uh, DEMs and also uh, CI surface topography. Uh, it allows, if you have two antennas in the along track, uh, we have sensitivity to ocean currents and sea ice uh, surface velocity. And as I've said a couple of times, uh, if you want to uh, do repeat pass, meaning that you, you fly over the same area uh, at one with, with days or hours or, or a week or a year, a temporal uh, separation, you can combine the two images and look at ground motion. And this is very useful for glaciers, permafrost, landslides, and so on. And having a system on an aircraft uh, provides a unique uh, opportunity to, to, to tailor uh, the observation to, to the phenomena you, you want to see. Uh, the satellites, they already have a very fixed observation uh, strategy. So for example, Sentinel-1 from uh, Copernicus has six days repeat time. And that is too long uh, to be able to, to, to monitor displacement or, or ground or movement of, of many of the glaciers in, in Svalbard. Uh, and of course, polarimet polarimetry is, is very important. It allows to improve the characterization of different targets. And of course, sea ice is, is one such example. Here you can see in the lower right, and a, a segmented product using both L and X band. This is from uh, Avi uh, from Wolfgang Dirking. And it, it, they have shown that, that these two frequencies, L and X band, they are very complementary uh, in order to provide more data, more information so that you can, you can obtain better uh, uh, segmentation of, of the ice. So you could, you could segment it into uh, different ice types. So it's very valuable to have both L and X band. Uh, just to show an uh, example uh, of uh, the spatial resolution difference. Uh, this is just an example here. You see an airborne data. This is collected from the uh, ESAR of DLR. Uh, so typical resolution here is, is five meters or eight meters, while the satellite data often have uh, tens of meters of resolution. And you can clearly see that resolution matters when you want to classify and, and really uh, be able to uh, interpret and to navigate uh, using this data. So to summarize, uh, we are quite confident that an airborne SAR in Svalbard is going to be a valuable asset for many purposes, not only for science, but also it uh, having a, a have it, having it on a plane which is in Svalbard provides a unique opportunity to do regular environmental monitoring, and it also provides a, a valuable asset for emergency response in uh, Svalbard. Uh, so. Uh, of course, we could collect data all year, also in clouds. 
we can collect data during the regular operations, as I said. And the dual frequency is very important, and it is in particular of interest for many of the uh, satellite operators, uh, for example, ESA and NASA, who are interested in validating their, L, their, their planned L-band missions. So I'll finish there. Thank you.